In the year 1630, in Edo period Japan, a ragged, masterless and destitute samurai named Hanshiro Sukomo enters a feudal lord's manor and requests permission to commit seppuku or ritual suicide in the courtyard. He is greeted by the lord's counsellor, who, suspecting that the man is there to extort money in exchange for not killing himself, attempts to dissuade him from this by telling the story of another samurai, who had not only come there to do the same, but had served under the same lord as Sukumo. During this period of Japanese history, the ruling Togogawa shogunate set about diminishing the power of local warlords or daimyo through exile, deprivation of fiefdoms or reduction in status, which left many of the samurai who served under these daimyo out of work and poverty-stricken, and some of them resorted to such dire tactics as feigning intent to commit seppuku so that the lords whose manor they went to would either offer them employment or pay them to leave. The samurai who the counselor tells Sugomo about was once as man, and he proceeds to relay a story of how they had punished him for this slight in what is one of the most brutal scenes ever put in a samurai film. But unbeknownst to the counselor, Sugomo already knows this story and has come there to serve hidden ulterior motives which no one in the manor can even begin to guess. Thus begins the 1962 Masaki Kobayashi directed film Harakiri, a classic of Japanese cinema and perhaps the director's masterpiece. And that is about all I can say about the story without ruining it, as what proceeds is a series of reveals that are slowly meted out through the film, the narrative jumping back in time to show why Sukumo has come, what his connection to the fallen samurai is and what his true intentions are, an ever unraveling story of injustice and bloody revenge, which serves as a critique of the samurai code and honor. Harakiri can be described as an anti-samurai film, as its depiction of the era and culture show the disastrous consequences the obsession with honor wreaks on the characters' lives and how those who espouse its value are hypocrites. It's an unromantic view of the era, the story putting a lot of focus on the main character's desperation brought on by poverty and the injustice brought upon them by the ruling elite. And when violence is depicted, it is mostly unstylized, messy and brutal, the film often cutting away right before the final blow is struck to rob the audience of catharsis and a feeling of triumph, giving the battle scenes a bitter feeling, as the point is not to show violence as a solution, but an unfortunate consequence which should have been avoided. And what's really amazing about the story is how it keeps you engaged despite it mostly consisting of people talking while sitting down, a large portion of it taking place in the same space, with very scant pieces of action sprinkled throughout. This is achieved through the film's meticulous drip feed of information, each consecutive reveal hooking you further and further into the narrative, the flashbacks coming at just the right time to make sure the audience is engaged throughout. This engagement is helped by the dramatic cinematography, particularly the use of Dutch angles, which come in at the film's most tense moments, giving the scenes where they appear an uneasy atmosphere, an atmosphere which is further enhanced by the score, the composer using a biva, a sort of Japanese lute for most of the soundtrack, which not only serves to create a sense of time and place, as it is an instrument which would have been used for narrative storytelling during the film's period, but it also helps set the mood for each scene, especially during the battles, where the composer ratchets the music up, the biva tune acting as build-up for the final strike. The last ingredient which keeps the audience engaged are the performances, in particular the film's lead actor, Tatsuya Nagatai. For most of his time on screen, he portrays a stoic demeanor, but manages to show that beneath lies a seething rage, hatred and a mocking disdain for the counselor and his underlings, using mostly his expressive eyes to full effect, giving what is perhaps a career best performance. He gives a sense that he's hiding something, like he's just waiting for the right opportunity to strike, which makes the scenes between him and the counselor so enthralling. And what's really amazing about his acting is that he was only 30 years old at the time, yet he manages to portray a man who is at least a decade older. Just look at his role as one of the antagonists in Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo to see what I mean. It came out only a year before Harakiri, yet he looks so different that if you were to tell me that the two movies were made a decade apart, I would believe it, his character in Yojimbo being far more youthful and virile, where his portrayal of Tsukomo is that of a broken man, weathered by age, with nothing left to lose. <laughs> Harakiri is a must-watch for fans of samurai films and cinephiles as a whole, the bite of its gripping narrative, incisive commentary and brutality having not dulled a bit throughout the several decades of its existence.